Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. The what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from the civil service examinations perspective. So today we are going to discuss the Hindu Delhi edition dated 21st June 2023. The important topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on your screen and a time stamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. So now let us begin our today's session. So first of all there is an important announcement for all of you. Rao's IAS has launched 10 series for the Political Science and International Relations optional subject. There will be 8 tests in the test series and you will get a timely and detailed evaluation of your attempt. This whole program is going to be under the mentorship of Mr. Rahul Puri sir. You will get personal attention and can discuss your queries and doubts with the Rao's IAS teachers. There is a link in the description which has more details so you can join the program and boost your preparation for the mains exam. The second announcement is in relation to the mains revision classes. Rao's IAS will be conducting mains revision classes for 2023 mains exam. Many of you would be aware of the fact that these classes have boosted the performance of many top rankers in the past like Anandya Rashi, Namrata Chaube and Pooja Jha and help them to score ranks in top 100. So what will be the features of this program? First, there will be around 150 hours of live online classes which will help you in revising all the important themes of all subjects in question-answer discussion mode. Two, there will be unlimited one-to-one -one mentorship from teachers of Rao's IAS. Three, there will be a test series which will simulate the exam-like experience multiple times before you take the actual exam. Plus, timely and detailed feedback will help you to write your best answers. Four, you will also get all the notes from the teacher's classes to help you revise all the topics. There will be 4 hours of classes every day from Monday to Friday. Respected teachers like Mr. Baswa Open, Fezan Khan, Arun Bhardwaj, I, Gaurav Tripathi, Shashank, Vaibhav Mishra sir, Mr. Rankit Kaul and Mr. Jatin Bhardwaj are looking forward to help you get top ranks once more in 2023. So enroll for the course and boost your chances to score your best. There is a link in the description and you can know more by clicking on that. So this is our first topic. This topic has appeared at science and tech section in today's The Hindu Delhi edition. The topic reads climate breakdown. The Arctic Ocean could be ice free by 2030s. So the immediate context of this very news article is that recently a study was conducted by an organization named as Nature Communications and it has predicted that by 2030s the Arctic Ocean could be ice free in summer. And we all understand that this is a worrying conclusion which has been drawn in the context of the climate change. Therefore, when it comes to the UPSC scheme of syllabus, this topic finds its relevance under two sections. One is the General Studies Mains Paper 1 in the section of Geography because it mentions the changes in the critical geographical features as its important component. Secondly, it also finds its relevance in General Studies Mains Paper 3 in the section of Environment. Also, if you go by the previous year question paper analysis, you will find that in Mains 2017, the question was asked, how does the cryosphere affect the global climate. So here the first question which should come into your mind is that what do you mean by cryosphere? So think about it. Does this cryosphere has any relation with the regions like Arctic, Antarctic as well as Himalayas? If your answer is yes then in this session you will learn that how the ice is responsible for regulating the climate over the earth and its atmosphere. How these regions, especially Arctic, Antarctic and Himalayas, which is also known as the third pole for this very reason, is important in regulating the Earth's heat budget. So now we will begin our session. First of all, if you go by the latitudinal division of the Earth's surface, there is a 66 and a half degree north latitude, beyond which up to the north pole, we call it as the Arctic region. Similarly, when we go into the southern hemisphere beyond 66 and a half degree, again we have a permanent frigid zone and here lies the Antarctic continent. So in today's session we will be learning only that how Arctic warming is creating the changes in the climate and also how climate change is affecting the Arctic melting. 
so to understand this concept first we need to know that what is the relation between the ice and the albedo now the question is what do you mean by albedo albedo is basically the reflectivity so we all know that if this is the earth surface and this is the sun all the insulation which is directed towards the earth surface after hitting the earth surface it gets back so this reflection of the light is known as the albedo now the albedo is also dependent upon various types of the surfaces so let us understand this in the geographical context so here i am taking three types of surfaces for our reference so this the first one is the bare ice surface this second surface is the ice surface but covered with snow and this third surface is the open oceans so let us assume that this is our sun so whatever insulation will be there on these three types of surfaces the reflectivity of these surfaces differ and therefore the reflection of those insulations will also differ the maximum reflectivity is of the bare ice because it has the brightest color so therefore whatever insulation is coming it will be reflecting back more than the other surfaces the insulation which will be there on this second surface which is the ice covered with snow it will be relatively in a lower amount compared to the bare ice and the reflection or the albedo from the open oceans will be least compared to the other two surfaces here also we have a reason to explain this the reason is that because bare ice has the brightest color so obviously it is going to reflect most of the insulation on the other hand the open oceans are relatively the transparent body so whatever insulation is coming on the open oceans or the water body most of this insulation gets entrapped it enters into the ocean up to certain depths and that is why a huge amount of heat is absorbed rather than being reflected back so if you have understood this basic concept the relationship between different types of surfaces in terms of ice and water and their relation with the amount of albedo now we can understand that how the melting of arctic is leading the climate change so before taking the session forward first we need to understand two basic key terms one is the multi year sea ice so what is multi year sea ice it is basically that ice which renews at the end of the summer which we can say is of the permanent nature so let us assume that if let's say this is the arctic region and this is the north pole and these are the lower latitudes compared to this let's say around 75 degree north so what will happen that with the changes in the seasons let's say in the summer season the snow or the ice from the lower latitudes it will get melted but despite the changes in summers this north pole is completely frozen so obviously between this north pole and this relatively lower latitudes there has to be some region beyond which we are having the ice throughout the year despite the changes in seasons and this is known as the permanent ice or the multi year sea ice and this ice is more thicker in nature and therefore because this ice is thicker in nature it also acts as a barrier between the oceans as well as the atmosphere so basically it prohibits the heat exchange between the lower latitudes with the higher latitudes and that is why this region is cold throughout the year and this region is warm throughout the year so this is the role of multi year sea ice now if we have understood this concept we can using our common sense think that if this barrier is broken then there will be faster exchange of heat between these latitudes between the continents between the oceans and the atmosphere which in turn will disturb the heat balance or the heat budget so this was the multi year sea ice the second key term is blue ocean event now what is blue ocean event 
so this is the phenomena where the arctic ocean will become ice free in summers for the first time so basically the arctic ocean is becoming ice free during summers if this happens that particular event will be known as the blue ocean event so this is in the common man's language layman language however this blue ocean event has also been defined technically and it is defined as the period or the time when the sea ice area drops below 1 million square kilometers so that means that it is not becoming absolutely ice free still we are having the ice in the arctic region but if the total area of ice in the arctic region is coming down coming below this particular level that is 1 million square kilometers we will call it as the blue ocean event and this also has a definition that why we are not considering it to be absolutely free the reason is that again for example at the 90 degree north pole or near the continents or the coastlines of the greenland suppose so we feel that there the ice will remain for a very long period despite the all the other major ice portions across the arctic would be melted so that is why scientists have given this relaxation but yes this unit is important if the area is coming below 1 million square kilometers and that too only in the sea ice area which means not in the antarctic because antarctica is a continent not the sea ice and arctic is the frozen water that is the sea ice and this is the basic difference between an arctic and the antarctica so this is the blue ocean event now if we again come back to this particular diagram whereby we saw that ice covered with snow was having a relatively lower reflectivity compared to the bare ice then the question come to your mind that what is the difference between ice and snow so let me clear this first the ice is basically the frozen water on the other hand snow is a form of precipitation whereby the water vapors have undergone condensation at the sub 0 degree celsius temperature so that means that water so that means that water vapor have not converted themselves into the liquid water because vapor is a gas it has not converted itself into the liquid form directly from the gas it has converted itself to the solid form that is snow and this is in the form of precipitation that means it is natural but ice is the frozen water ice we can generate it in our refrigerators also that means that ice can be generated naturally as well as artificially and the reflectivity of ice because it is more permanent in nature it is more thicker in nature is always higher than the snow so in continuation of this now we shall understand that what do we mean by the positive feedback system and how the warming of arctic is leading to the positive feedback here again i want to stress on one more key term which is known as the arctic amplification so arctic amplification is basically the warming up of the arctic region leading to or amplifying the certain processes which are those processes we will be discussing it but the amplification of these processes is also known as the positive feedback the reason is the output of one system again increases the input of that very system we shall understand this with the help of a schematic so now let us assume that arctic is melting right and if the arctic is melting then obviously the ice cover is deteriorating if the ice cover is deteriorating can we say that the albedo is also reducing the reason is for higher albedo we required higher amount of ice but if we are not having the ice then obviously the albedo will reduce if the albedo is reducing that means the reflection the outgoing solar insulation is reducing so obviously that solar insulation is not going out and it's being entrapped within the earth atmosphere if the solar insulation is being entrapped into the earth atmosphere can i say that the heat in the earth atmosphere is increasing so now if the heat in the earth atmosphere is increasing 
again it is going to fuel the arctic melting so that means that the output of this system has basically again increased the input the starting point of this system and that is why it is known as the positive feedback system or the amplified processes now let us move towards another dimension if the heat is increasing in the earth's atmosphere can i say that oceans are also warming up if the oceans are warming up then obviously ocean acidification is taking place if ocean acidification is taking place then obviously it is going to detrimentally affect the marine life we all know that marine life is known for carbon sequestration that means it absorbs the carbon so if the marine life is deteriorating it will mean that carbon sequestration is also reducing which means that higher amount of carbon dioxide will be there in atmosphere and if the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases we know that this is basically a greenhouse gas so again the heat in the atmosphere will increase and it will again lead to the melting of the arctic so again supporting the initial point of, of this system similarly if the heat is getting entrapped in the earth atmosphere it is going to change the heat budget of the earth atmosphere if the heat budget is changing that means that the latitudinal heat is also going to change so which will mean that the higher latitudes will be increasing the heat absorption because earlier they were cooler in nature now they will become warm which in turn will alter the thermal as well as the pressure differences and if the thermal and pressure differences are taking place on the earth surface it will mean that it will weaken the wind systems if the wind systems are again weakening that means that the wind is not able to redistribute the heat which means at a particular location again the heat is increasing which in turn again will lead to increasing arctic melting so now can you understand that how a phenomena in just one region that is arctic is creating havoc in several other geophysical processes for example the oceans atmosphere etc now let us also understand the impact of this arctic amplification on various ecosystems so for this to understand let me draw a rough world map so this is india this is a southeast asian region going towards the eastern coast of china this is african region here it is being drawn as europe connecting it with siberian region and the eastern asian coast here we have southeast asian countries just a rough map here i am having australia here i am having south america this is north america this is the eastern coast this is the hudson bay here is the central america going towards california and this is the alaskan region so let us assume that this is our rough world map and the arctic amplification i am denoting it with the red color because the heat is increasing so that means this is the particular region where the temperature or the heat entrapment is increasing which means that melting is increasing so now let us understand its various impacts on other ecosystems first if the melting is increasing that means that oceans are also becoming warmer and we have already understood the impact which it will lead to on the marine life as well as the movement of the ocean currents right if the ocean is warming up don't you think that it will further invite number of cyclones this is the reason also that why in the arabian sea region the frequency and intensity of the tropical cyclone is increasing and waters are becoming warmer and warm water is one of the chief condition for the formation of tropical cyclones so that means that the cyclones will also increase if there is arctic melting the sea level will also increase and if the sea level is increasing it means that the coastal areas will experience flood conditions right so there will be flooding in the coastal regions if the overall temperature of the atmosphere is increasing 
that means heat is increasing so this increased heat can also lead to forest fires in amazon in congo region in the southeast asian tropical forests similarly the bush fires in australia if the temperature is increasing we will also experience the heat waves in the european region because of this global warming there will be weakening of the polar vortex and we understand that if the polar vortex is weakened so it will again bring in relatively cold or harsh winters in north america this can also lead to desertification so the idea is that changes in one particular ecosystem has the detrimental impacts on various other ecosystems across the globe and this is not true only for the arctic melting if you go to the question which was asked in upsc that was in relation to the cryosphere that how the cryosphere is affecting the global climate and cryosphere is not just restricted to the arctic region it is also happening in antarctica it is also happening in the himalayan region for example if the himalayan glaciers are melting it is directly going to affect the fresh water resources ground water resources are you getting this thing so that is how this cryosphere controls or regulates the climate of earth by regulating the heat budget by transporting the excessive heat to those areas which have the lesser heat they control the temperature they affect the albedo rates they also have their role in controlling the temperature of oceans as well as the winds and this is how this cryosphere affects the global climate and that is the reason that why this process of arctic amplification is of grave concern in today's times so this was a pretty lengthy topic so let me revise this topic in brief once again this topic has appeared in science and tech section in today's the hindu daily edition in the context of the recent study by the nature communications which has predicted that by 2030s arctic ocean could be ice free in this relation we saw that how the questions from this sphere has been asked in upsc then we started our session by having a look at the latitudinal divisions and understanding that where this arctic region lies then with the help of this diagram we saw that how there is a difference in reflectivity or the albedo rates in the different surfaces that is bare ice or the ice covered with snow or the open oceans here we understood that what is the basic difference between ice and snow then we came to two important key terms that is the multi year sea ice which has its own properties because of which it has its own significance second was blue ocean event from the current affairs context with the help of this we understand that what is the positive feedback system what do we mean by arctic amplification and how this positive feedback system works in case of arctic melting in the last we discussed that how the changes in one particular ecosystem that is the arctic ecosystem and its melting has its impacts over various other ecosystems across the world moving towards our second topic which has appeared at page number 4 this topic is in the context of the recent floods in the state of rajasthan which has occurred because of the cyclonic activity in the arabian sea moving towards the gujarat coast and entering into the state of rajasthan we all are aware about the recent cyclone which was named as biparjoy now from the geographical perspective what are cyclones why the recent increase in intensity and frequency of cyclones in the arabian sea is happening how it is going to affect the onset of monsoon we have covered all these dimensions in the previous dns that is why in today's session what we are going to deal with is the management of the floods and therefore when it comes to the upsc scheme of syllabus this management of floods or the disaster management basically falls under general studies mains paper 3 in the subsection of disaster management however an interesting fact of this context is that we all know that rajasthan broadly is a arid or semi arid state this is the broad political map of rajasthan and this is the physiographic division of rajasthan so if you say that the districts which are most affected by this bipar jaisal land which are experiencing flood like situations are barmer jalor and sirohi that is the southern districts 
the southern rajasthan mostly has a temperature of relatively humid compared to the core western rajasthan if you see here that a great indian desert lies in the western area covering the certain portions of barmer jaisalmer jodhpur and bikaner the other half portion of the barmer if you see here is of the luni plains luni which is the ephemeral river which flows in the state of rajasthan originating from the aravalli range in this context there are certain other hills which are important for example the chappan hills erinpura hills mukandra hills besides these hills there are certain important regions in rajasthan which are also important for example this hadoti plain chittor hills luni delta as well as khetri hills also diwan basin and sambar basin are important so these are certain physiographic areas in rajasthan which are important from the prelims perspective the orientation of the location of aravalli is, is somewhat like this so this is the aravalli range so in this context now let us see that what are various management and prevention strategies in the context of floods now management and prevention of the floods has two important components first are those steps which are to be taken during the floods that is when we are facing the disasters what we have to do and second are the long term steps so that we are able to prevent the frequent occurring of the floods in assam in the long run so let us understand this one by one if we are already facing the flood situation the first important task is the restoration of the communications because many a times it happens during the times of natural disasters like floods the communication lines are shut down or they are broken and that is why the people and administration are not able to contact with each other efficiently and hence to establish that communication restoration of those lines are very essential second is deployment of the national disaster response forces as well as sdrs in order to have efficient evacuations from those areas the people from the low lying areas must be transported to the higher areas in order to reduce the possibility of deaths due to floods then is the relief measures relief measures can include several steps for example tenting of the displaced population food supplies water supplies and in this association the fourth important point is also the medical aid many a time we tend to forget this important step in our answer now this medical aid is not just in the terms of medicines this medical aid must also be accompanied with the psychological support you try to generate empathy for those people who have lost their family their property their documents everything during the floods and they are now relocated to certain higher areas what mental trauma they are been going through we have to empathize with it no matter how much food water or tenting facilities you provide them until and unless you are not able to provide the psychological support to that displaced population to that person who has lost everything during the disaster these measures will not be able to bring the fruitful results in this very line the role of civil society organizations are very important obviously the central government state government along with the district administration should take the lead in managing these disasters but because of the sheer presence of the civil society organizations in the far flung areas they must also be integrated in order to reap the maximum benefits now these were the measures which should be taken during the floods and now we will come towards the long term measures the first is the micro zonation of the floods in india we must prepare a map in fact we have that map but that map should be updated regularly because there is a continuous change in topography landforms human induced factors in several areas and that is why the factors behind the floods the vulnerable areas of those floods they continuously change that is why regular upgradation of the micro zonation of the flood maps must be done second is the land use management 
Now, as far as possible, we must try to have sustainable forest management practices. We must strengthen our wetlands. We must protect our floodplains. And the agricultural activities which are taken must be in line with the climate of that particular area. The crops must be roped, which suits the geoclimatic conditions of those areas. Next comes the proper management of the dams. Next is the modern town planning principles, for example, the sponge cities. Now, what is the concept of sponge cities? Now, suppose this is a city having numerous buildings and concrete areas spread across. Now, sponge cities are those cities which are designed to harvest the natural waters. How can that be done? It can be done by having the pervious flooring conditions so that the waters which are available in those areas, for example, these pond cities must have adequate blue and green spaces. There must be some pond, there can be some rivers nearby. So all the water, whether it is already available water or the waters which comes through the frequent precipitation, all that water must pass through this pervious floorings and the ground water must be recharged of these cities. That is why they are known as sponge cities. Just like the sponges which absorb the water, these cities must also be able to absorb that water which in turn can supply the residents of these cities with the drinking water or sanitation water or etc. So the modern town planning activities like sponge cities must also be encouraged. Next, we must also focus on river interlinking projects so as to supply the excess water from the surplus basins to the deficit basins. And in the last, we must also go with the desilting measures of the river channels. The channels which are excessively prone to high deposition, for example, in Assam. Desilting activities must be done in order to increase regularly the capacity of the existing river channels. Now, this topic has appeared at text and context page. The topic reads the climate lawsuit against the Delta Airlines. Now, from the examination's perspective, this topic is mainly relevant from the prelims perspective because under this topic, there are two key terms that is greenwashing and carbon offset. However, before going to those key terms, first let us understand that what is the immediate context of this article. Under this article, there is a Delta Airlines which claimed that during its travel, they are carbon neutral, which means that the amount of the carbon which they are emitting, all that amount is offset by them because of various initiatives which they take. So therefore, in 2020, the Delta Airlines marketed itself as the world's first carbon neutral airline. It said that it has invested around $1 billion on reducing the fuel usage and carbon removal techniques. However, the veracity of these claims is now under scrutiny because a lawsuit has been filed against them claiming that all these claims are misleading. Also, if you go back to the previous year question paper analysis, in 2022, the question was asked in relation to the greenwashing. So we shall come at this question later. First, let us understand that what do we mean by these two terms that is greenwashing and carbon offsetting. So first of all, greenwashing is the act of making false or misleading statements about the environmental benefits of a product or practice. For example, let's say if I am making some product and I have consumed a considerable or significant amount of energy in building this product, but to attract those customer base which is environment friendly, which believes in environmental sustainability, I am advertising this product to be green enough. So this I am doing basically to expand my consumer base. So that is why it can be a way for companies to continue or expand their polluting as well as related harmful behaviors. And they are well intentionally targeted towards this specific consumer base. So we can take another example also. So how does this greenwashing is being promoted? Let us understand this. Suppose taking the second example, I am building some product. I am using some amount of energy, let's say, to build this one unit of product. I was consuming earlier 10 units of energy. And now I invest my money into upgrading of this technology. And now 
I am making this same product by using just eight units of energy. So technically speaking, obviously I have reduced two units of energy consumption. So I can say that now my product is greener. But here lies the catch. The reason that why this green washing is uh, being misused is because there are no exact definitions that what do we mean by a green product? What do we exactly mean by eco-friendly product? Can I consider that just a small reduction in energy consumption can be termed as eco-friendly? Let's say I am building a thermal plant based on coal. Now also that thermal plant is being operated on the basis of that coal only, but I have reduced the amount of coal being used by some amount. So what will be this some amount? Is there any boundary to define it that beyond this amount we can call it to be eco-friendly or not? Obviously there is no definition for this and that is the and that is why such vague definitions create the legal loopholes. So this is greenwashing. Now let us come to the carbon offsetting. Carbon offsetting basically allows the individuals or companies to invest in environmental projects around the world in order to balance out their own carbon footprints. Now again I am taking an example. Let's say I was having a thermal plant based on coal. And this was emitting, let's say, 100 units of greenhouse gases. So now because I cannot shut down my thermal plants, there is a lot of employment which is being generated by these plants. But obviously I have to be environmentally responsible. So there is another way out for me. What I can do is that I can plant some amount of trees in different areas so that I can reabsorb this 100 units from the atmosphere. The 100 units which I was generating from these thermal plants are now being offset by planting these trees or by investing some in another technology which can reduce the 100 units. So basically I am not reducing my emissions. All what I am doing is that I am just offsetting the emission which I was generating. And that is where lies the catch because it can have a negative impact also. The reason is because I know that I can now offset the GHG emissions, so I will not be in a behavior to reduce the emissions from these thermal plants, rather I will be increasing. Let's say now I am emitting 200 units, the only thing is that then I will be planting more trees. So this is basically the carbon offset mechanism. Now let us see that what was the question asked in 2022. Which one of the following best describes the term greenwashing? Option A suggests conveying a false impression that a company's products are eco-friendly and environmentally sound. So we have discussed this thing and that is why option A is the correct answer. So this was all about greenwashing and carbon offsetting. This article has appeared at page number 9. The article reads Semiconductor Fab, the Unfinished Agenda. We all know that in today's time, in order to promote manufacturing and also in order to strengthen the strategic capabilities of any conductor, the semiconductor manufacturing industries is one of the key industries to achieve that goal. And that is why it's also important for our UPSC civil service examination. Because in our general studies mains paper 1 in the section of geography, there is an important component which says the locational factors for primary, secondary and tertiary industries. So in this very regard, we should be aware that what are the locational factors for this and what are the various challenges as well as the government initiatives being taken in this regard. So this is a reference article for today because, because I have covered this topic in much detail in the DNS dated 1st June 2023 whereby I have discussed all the location factors for semiconductor manufacturing industry in terms of cost, workforce, transportation, infrastructure, market as well as government policies. We have seen the key growth drivers which are driving this particular industry. In that DNS, I have also discussed various challenges associated with it in terms of high cost of establishment, ease of doing business, technological constraints, structural as well as policy constraints and the unstable power supply. 
So I request you to the, go back to the DNS dated 1st June 2023 in order to understand the associated as well as important dimensions for the semiconductor industry. So that is all for today. All the very best and study hard.